So before we start uh, the discussion, may I ask you a few questions? Um, uh, in terms of your personal experience with those people, if you talk about your management plan for these people coming from the doors, I mean, in the hospital, probably you have a, a bit of um, time, resource, and you can manage people in a way, in, in a systematic way, I would say. What about the private sector when you come across such people you want to do a science lift on somebody on uh, alendronic uh, acid? What's the protocol you will follow? If I'm perfectly honest with you, Shihab, I, I don't do anything different. My management in practice where I deliver an IMOS service, as you know, is almost exactly the same as, as it is in the hospital. Um, the most important thing is a thorough history and examination. If something doesn't add up, I always go back and recheck the history and recheck the history and recheck the history. Unfortunately, she have some patients will tell you only what they want you to hear. They, will, they, they may keep from the clinician that they have been historically on a bisphosphonate. Right. And if, if a clinical picture doesn't make sense, keep asking and digging and digging and asking until, the, the, until we get to the, to the bottom of it. And I've never given up on this fact. I've, I've actually had a patient recently, um, and I'm, I'm sure it was not malicious in any way. She'd totally forgotten that she was on uh, a, a biological, that she used to get a, an infusion at the hospital every, every six months. And she was referred to me by her general dental practitioner for uh, a non-healing tooth socket. Uh, was there a root left behind? Could this be a, a, an osteomyelitis? And um, I, I just looked at her and it looked like Emronge. And I said to her, I'm really sorry. I think this is, this is what I think it is. And um, I, I gave instructions to the GDP to prescribe antibiotics, etc. And um, um, she came back and there was, there was no improvement until I then asked and I kept asking and digging what other medical problems have you had? Have you ever had to go to hospital to have any infusions? And all of a sudden, she, she remembered that she was on an IV, uh, IV biological along the lines of denisumab or pyrolia, etc. And uh, we knew. Now we, we got to the bottom of it, and we were able to manage the, the condition. So I think it's really important that if clinically it makes sense, um, that, we, that you just keep digging until you get to the bottom of it. I think that's the most important a uh, bit of information I, 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 I would say, or a bit of advice I could give people. Does that answer your question, Shriham? Shriham, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Yeah, just uh, another, uh, I would say, um, issue to do with the healing of the jawbone and the soft tissue surrounding it. If you were about to remove a keratosis or dentitial cyst and you will open a big flap um, in contact with uh, a bone or like a, a mandible, uh, do you think there is any potential of developing it's a problem uh, in terms of having a bronch or embronch in such patients? Yes, uh, absolutely, Shihab. And any, any, uh, 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 any procedure that requires bone healing and bone turnover in the maxillofacial region can predispose people to embronch. There, there's no doubt about that in my head. It doesn't have to be a dental extraction. It could be any procedure where the bone is required to remodel or to, uh, or to, or to undertake a healing process, uh, angiogenesis, et cetera. And we'll cover that in, in the lecture as we go along. But any procedure along those lines will put people at risk of emeralds. There's, there's no doubt about that in my head. Right. OK. Uh, another thing, probably this is anecdotal. Please don't take my word for it. But my observation that bronze is more relevant in the maxilla more than the mandible, and ORN is more relevant or more 
uh, problematic in the mandible. Uh, this is my observations uh, so through the patients coming through the doors. Is there anything, any evidence behind this or any study yes. you come across that yes. branch yes. and branch more relevant or more prevalent, I would say, yes. in the yes. medicine? It's all down to do, she have with the healing potential and the vascularity of the tissues. Now, we're going to touch about it in the lecture in a minute, but the mandible, by definition, is much more cortical. And over time, as patients age, and obviously the patients that are that succumb to this condition or patients that suffer with MRONG by definition will have, uh, will be probably in the older age group and probably with more medical comorbidities, then by definition, these patients will have lost the central blood flow to the mandible. Therefore, as I'm sure you're well aware, any bone has a central blood supply and a peripheral blood supply. The central blood supply is via a named vessel. The peripheral blood supply is by the periosteum. And over time, the ID vessels do sclerose, and that's been proven scientifically. There's a lovely paper by Etu et al. in uh, 2002, I think. It was a study from Southampton. I was involved with it. And this, the, the, the paper confirmed that you do get significant reduction in central blood flow of the mandible uh, with age and with other uh, vascular processes, atherosclerosis, etc. And because of this region, the blood supply to the mandible is much more uh, uh, reduced much less porous than the maxilla is. And obviously, the more blood flow you have, the more healing you will be able to achieve, and, and hence the, um, the, the, the pathological processes being more in the mandible. Now, I, I agree ORN is more prevalent in the mandible, probably because she have of the uh, beam, uh, the, the design of the beam that that, so essentially we're irradiating the tongue base, we're irradiating the soft palate, we're irradiating the tonsil area or the neck with radiotherapy in the maxillofacial region. And the mandible will receive a much larger dose by definition compared to the maxilla. So I, I think ORN, it's very difficult to compare ORN and MRONG, even though they are similar in clinical presentation and in classification, they are really two distinct disease entities. And I think ORN in the mandible is more prevalent purely because of the physics of delivering the radiation to the tumor bed, if you see what I mean. You're going to have to go through the mandible in much higher dosage compared to the maxilla. So I think MRONG will be prevalent in both maxilla and mandible. Uh, I, I, I still believe it'll be in slightly varying forms, but not based on the pathogenesis, but based on the fact that the underlying disease process is one at the cellular level. Whereas with radiotherapy ORN, and we'll touch that during the lecture she had, is that uh, the mandible will probably will have had a much higher dose of radiation compared to the maxilla for most maxillofacial tumors. Thank you very much for this uh, brief introduction. Um, let me um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Algomi, for joining us tonight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for joining the London Dental Academy for another uh, interesting webinar with Mr. Algomi. Mr. Algomi is a consultant in maxillofacial surgery uh, at QA Hospital in Portsmouth, and uh, he's been there for almost eight uh, years working as a consultant. Prior to that, he spent uh, about, I think, five, six years training in the South Coast area. Uh, in maxillofacial, different units in Southampton, um, Poole Hospital, and uh, Portsmouth. He's currently actually covering a few hospitals, not only Portsmouth. He is the clinical director of the maxillofacial unit at uh, Isle of Wight, St. Mary's Hospital, and he does some maxillofacial reconstruction um, at Southampton Hospital uh, with the maxillofacial team, uh, post-cancer reconstruction. So he's been there for almost uh, 25 years in the South Coast region, is well-known figure uh, in reconstruction, orthognathic surgery, and also in um, skin cancer and trauma. I'd like to welcome on your behalf, Mr. Algomi, on this webinar, and very much hope that uh, all of you will join it, and I'm sure that you will enjoy it, as uh, I do enjoy working with Mr. Algomi whenever we have got a chance to work together, especially in post-cancer reconstruction. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Algomi, for joining us, and it's a pleasure to have you tonight, and Good. hopefully... Good you will uh, always also you have the time to educate us on your experience with branch and the
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ramit, for a fantastic introduction. I, I don't deserve all of this. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and it's my pleasure to work alongside uh, your good self and my other colleagues at, uh, at QA Hospital Portsmouth. Um, as as uh, Mr. Ramit was saying, I'm one of the maxillofacial consultants at Portsmouth, and I'm going to share with you my experience of MRONJ. Um, I do apologize initially for the dryness of the first uh, third of the lecture, which is basic science and related to bone biology more than anything. So, I, But I also make no apology for going through this process. I think it's very important that we are very that, that we understand the basic science involved behind uh, medication uh, related osteonecrosis of the jaw uh, but also to appreciate the differences in pathogenesis between similar conditions such as ORN, uh, fibrous dysplasia, Paget's disease and we're going to go through them briefly but predominantly I'll be starting the first part of my lecture talking about bone biology then I will talk about the clinical presentation of MRONJ. I will move on to discuss the Scottish guidelines um, uh, published in 2017 by which uh, we, uh, we all uh, follow and I have to say I, I, I mirror my practice to uh, the, the Scottish guidelines and details and finally I'll discuss a few uh, potential bone problems that I've come across as a consultant so it, it'll be a very hopefully an interesting last third uh, to the lecture. So uh, essentially speaking, um, just for a definition, for the sake of definitions, uh, medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw is defined as having necrotic bone exposed in the maxillofacial region, lasting more than eight weeks in previously treated patients with bisphosphonates that have not undergone head and neck radiotherapy. And I think it is absolutely crucial to underline the duration of the exposure of the bone, the fact that these, this group of patients have had to have had a form of bisphosphonate therapy in the past, uh, or the new biologicals uh, such as denesumab, pyloria, etc., or patients that have, un that have not undergone uh, head and neck radiotherapy. So it's really important to underline the fact that they, they cannot have had radiotherapy in the past. If we just cover a little bit about basic bone biology, and I'm going to start with remodeling, as I'm sure everyone is aware, we do turn over 60% of, of our whole skeleton per annum. So there's a very active, resorptive, and bone building process that is literally continuous. It's, it's all the time, and that involves every single bone in our body, including the maxillofacial region. The uh, resorption and the deposition are controlled by many different factors, and we're going to go down to cellular control in a minute. But there are genetic predispositions um, that also control the degree of bone turnover uh, that patients go with. If 60% is resorbed and 60% is rebuilt, then patients will remain stable, and that's representative of most of us as adults. In conditions such as osteopenia and osteoporosis, you get your standard 60% turnover, 60% resorption, but you do not get the same amount of bone deposition, and hence the pathogenesis of osteopenia and osteoporosis. We're going to talk about the impact of uh, bisphosphonates in a minute on this process, but it's really important to understand the physiological basis of it. As I'm sure you're well aware, osteoclasts are our resorptive cells and the osteoblasts are our bone building cells. Taking us back to the good old days of the microscope, you have an osteon, you have a bone unit as they call it, uh, well known as the haversion system, you have a central blood supply, you have osteocytes, as you can see, that are locked within the bone that connect with each other through these canaliculi. And you have the surface of the bone lined by osteoblasts, and you have the occasional osteoclast that sits on the surface of the bone. Now, I think it's, it's really, really important to stop here and to go through the signaling processes that happen within the remodeling process so that if we understand the physiology, we'll be able to understand the pathology as we go along. 
So the brains that control the whole process are actually the osteocytes. The osteocytes that sit within their lacunae, within the central, within the bone haversian system, send signals to the osteoblasts that sit on the surface. The osteoblasts are then in control of the whole process. The osteoblasts release cytokines that are autocrine and they are also paracrine. So they act on the neighboring uh, osteoclastic cells. Without the osteocytes, the signal won't come. Without the osteoblast, the signal will not be acted on. That's, that's how I sort of see it and, and understand the whole process. I'm going to talk about osteoclasts in a minute, but it's really important to, to, to appreciate that osteoclasts have no decision-making process. Osteoclasts are purely cells that act on the under the influence of other cell signals. And we'll, we'll, we'll go through that in a minute. So the statement that I put on the side is that osteocytes regulate the recruitment of osteoclasts by inducing the, the expression of rank L, and we're going to talk about rank L uh, in a minute by the osteoblastic cells. I'm going to touch base on the osteoclasts now. Osteoclasts, by definition, are made up of monocytes or macrophages that rotate into the bloodstream. And those monocytes and macrophages get recruited. So they're simple monocytes that are well known to our immune system. They're an integral part of our immune system. And these monocytes are quite rounded cells with a rounded central nucleus. And what they do is that under the influence of the osteoblasts, they start to coalesce and group together to form uh, an osteoclastic cell. So you've got your standard monocytes, they group together and they form a multinucleated giant cell that becomes the osteoclast. Multinucleated giant cells are present in many disease processes, in granulomatous conditions, in many, in many situations we see them under the microscope, giant cell tumors, etc. But the process behind them is that they originate from simple macrophages that rotate into the bloodstream uh, and that are an integral part of our immune system. These multinucleated uh, giant cells then settle onto the, um, uh, the, the surface of the bone and they form a ruffle border. Well, again, we'll go through that in a little while. And that's, it is these cells that start the bone resorptive process. The control of these cells is via the rank and rank L system. Rank essentially is a surface, cell surface receptor that develops onto the surface of the osteoclast. It's the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B. And there is a ligand that is produced by the osteoblasts. That's the purple little blobs there. These purple blobs lock into the rank receptor and they become the rank L unit. And this is what activates the osteoclastic activity. This is what initiates the, the, the settling of the osteoclast onto the surface and the commencement of bone resorption. Drugs, for example, such as denisumab, work very, very simply by blocking these rank receptors. So if you see those little antibodies that are present there, they, they block uh, the, uh, the rank ligand that is produced and it prevents the rank L or the rank L ligand uh, union and thereby they deactivate or reduce the activity of the osteoclasts uh, on the bone surface. To balance the bone resorptive activity, you've got osteoprotegrin, OPG, which is also produced by the osteoblasts, and it is inhibitory to osteoclastic activity. So this is a direct inhibitory process compared to the rank L activation or uh, 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 resorptive processes that are undertaken. Uh, OPG is, again, as I said, produced by the osteoblasts, but under signaling from the osteocytes. So it's really important to always understand that it is the osteocytes that undertake the initial uh, uh, signal to the osteoblasts who then uh, stimulate OPG production to uh, activate or, de or deactivate the um, osteoclasts. Another group of, of bone protective uh, uh, proteins is the 
bone morphogenetic proteins, what we call BMPs. They, again, they're a group of signaling molecules uh, that belong to the transforming growth factor beta superfamily of proteins. So transforming growth factor beta is an integral part of many, many cells in the body. It is present in the intestines, it's present in, in, in many different tissues in the body. And it is that family of super proteins that actually uh, uh, are, are protective of bone. They induce bone growth. And again, they work uh, alongside the osteoblasts to inhibit osteoclastic activity. So transforming growth factor beta is one of the significant uh, factors. And the mode of action of transforming growth factor beta is that it directly impacts rank L union. So it, it is down regulatory for uh, uh, the rank L process. So rank L up regulation and down regulation. Things that increase rank L will be more bone resorptive as we've discussed. So you've got your parathyroid, you've got your vitamin D3, you've got calcium, glucocorticoids, prostaglandins, IL1, 6, 11, 17. I think the diagram on the side, I'm, I'm, I'm a very visual person, so I tend to depend on diagrams for, uh, for, for understanding and, 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 and appreciating things. And most importantly, rank L down regulation, which is bone protective, is this super family of transforming growth factor beta of which BMP born bone morphogenetic proteins is, is, is an integral part. So now that we've discussed a little summary about both the bone resorptive and the bone protective factors, and as you can see, none of those signals are originating from the osteoclasts. All the osteoclasts do is that they act on various signals that they receive from a whole host of factors all around them. So the osteoblastic activity by the rank L system to induce bone resorption, you've got your OPG, your osteoprotegrin uh, uh, protective mechanisms that prevent osteoclastic activity. And then you've got other exogenous factors. So estrogens, progesterone, cortisols, parathyroid um, hormone, as we said, vitamin D3, thyroxin, uh, but also the interleukins um, that are produced as part of the inflammatory process. Uh, bone morphogenetic proteins are down here on the side, and as I said, they're part of the transforming growth beta, uh, factor beta family. So I'm very sorry about the science heavy bit, but thankfully now we're gonna get to some, uh, some clinical parts. So bisphosphonates. First synthesized, 1865. I, I, I was very intrigued when I was doing a little bit of research for this lecture, but they were really synthesized as um, uh, to, to work in industry as a fertilizer. It had nothing to do with medicine. It was a corrosion inhibitor chemical, uh, predominantly used as, as a fertilizer. Uh, we only introduced it into medicine uh, about 25 uh, years ago when, when the first trials came, and came on board. But, the things to really recognize is that it has a very, very long half-life with an accumulation of bone over time. And this is the one aspect of clinical practice that still has not been nailed down. When, when, when someone says, how long have you been on a bisphosphonate for? How, long, how much will this affect uh, 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 the healing process? How will it affect extractions? It's really difficult because it does have an accumulative effect uh, an accumulative uh, position within, within bone uh, over time. And the less we're turning over bone because of osteoporosis or osteopenia, the less we're getting rid of the bisphosphonates that are present within our bone stock. So it's really, really important to take into account. It's got a very long half-life with a significant accumulation in bone over time. It is incredible. It has a very low absorption orally, about 1% of the total dose. Uh, even though we, they're given to patients orally on a weekly basis, as I'm sure you're well aware, with a bottle of water first thing in the morning, uh, uh, a lot of it is, is destroyed in first pass metabolism through the liver, and only 1% is absorbed orally. Uh, when it comes to IV, it is rapidly removed from the plasma when administered IV, and 40% is unmetabolized. So you can instantly tell you've got a 60% uptake in IV compared to 1% oral. And I think that forms the basis of how we are so much more concerned about patients on IV bisphosphonates as opposed to patients on oral bisphosphonates. Uh, 
Very briefly, um, things that we know, the indications of oral agents predominantly is osteoporosis and Paget's disease of the bone. With osteoporosis, you get decreased bone turnover, as we discussed. You've got adipocyte differentiation. You've got infiltration uh, of fiber fatty tissue within the marrow, and progressively, you, you, you achieve parotid bone. With Paget's disease, you have accelerated bone turnover, reduced compressive strength of the bone, increased vascularity. So not fiber fatty marrow as happens in osteoporosis, but an increase in the vascularity of the bone leading to bone pain, microfractures, and ultimately pathological fractures. So these are the main indications for oral uh, bisphosphonates. When it comes to IV agents, our main indications are predominantly bone metastasis, um, to prevent pathological fractures and, and, cord, and compression of main of, of, of important anatomic structures. Cord compression is one of the main ones. Uh, hypercalcemia uh, as a separate entity. Bone resorptive processes such as fibrous dysplasia. Rank L mediated osteoclastic resorption. So, a really good example is multiple myeloma, and I fully appreciate the processes behind multiple myeloma are slightly different to bone metastases. Even though they're, bone, they're both tumors and they both affect bone, the pathogenesis of multiple myeloma is slightly different to the disease process uh, that causes uh, bone metastases and uh, pathological fractures. So rank L-mediated osteoclastic resorption, multiple myeloma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and finally, uh, PHT-like peptide osteoclastic resorption. So, it's been well documented now that certain tumors, especially small cell lung carcinomas, are able to produce a peptide that is very similar in structure to parathyroid hormone. So it's, it's a PHT-like peptide that is released by certain tumors, predominantly small cell lung cancers. And these parathyroid-like peptides act exactly as if they are parathyroid hormone. Uh, and they cause uh, bone resorption. So again, that's one of the major indications for IV bisphosphonates. Now, how do bisphosphonates act on the osteoclast, uh, on, on, on reduction, sorry, of bone uh, turnover? And it is really, they are absolutely toxic to osteoclasts. They induce apoptosis. They inhibit the release of bone-inducing proteins, BMPs, transforming growth, growth factor beta, as we discussed. They reduce bone tur turnover and resorption, they reduce serum calcium, and they ultimately cause a state of hypermineralization of the bone, what we term as sclerosis of the bone. And I'm sure we've all seen uh, radiographic evidence of sclerotic bone in, in patients on, on this group. To go into a little bit more uh, molecular basis, essentially the bisphosphonates ingested either orally or IV attach themselves to hydroxyapatite binding sites on on the cell surface. Now this will be dispersed across the whole bone surface. Every part of our bone, be it maxillofacial or uh, any other bone in the body, will have deposits of bisphosphonates within them. Now these deposits just sit there and they sit on the binding sites of the hydroxyapatite. When osteoclasts attempt to resorb the bone, then and only then is the bisphosphonate released. And once it's released, it, it essentially does everything that we spoke about in the other slide. On a molecular basis, how do they affect osteoclastic activity? Number one, they prevent the attachment of the osteoclast on the bone surface. So the osteoclast, as you can see, it's the multinucleated cell. It's got a ruffle border underneath and it has to sit on a lacuna, a lacuna on the bone surface, and it has to seal itself because this sealing zone is what creates a low pH environment on the ruffle border. And what the bisphosphonates do is that they prevent this seal, they stop the seal of the osteoclast on the surface of the bone, thereby re preventing the low pH compartment, thereby preventing bone resorption. Now, hydrogen and uh, alkaline phosphatase are responsible for the low pH environment here. And if you're not gonna get a low pH environment, your, your alkaline phosphatase is not going to act on the bone. And that prevents bone resorption. So you've got a, uh, 
reduction in the ceiling zone and you've got a, 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 a prevention of the low pH environment within the lacuna. Eventually, you've got reduced oste osteoclastic progenitor development, so you do not get the union of the macrophages together to form a large osteoclast. And finally, as we discussed, it promotes intracellular signaling to prevent, uh, uh, to promote apoptosis. And essentially, apoptosis, as I'm sure you're well aware, is programmed cell death, and this is induced by the uh, bisphosphonates released from the bone. Now, on a clinical front, it, MRONG is restricted to the maxillofacial region. And this is a, a very, very interesting patho pathogenesis of this condition. And a lot of research has gone into why other bones of the, in the body are never, absolutely never affected by MRONG. It has to be the bones of the maxilla and the mandible. And the reason is simply because the maxilla and the mandible are in constant uh, contact with the outside environment. With tooth brushing, you get a bacteremia. With ingesting food, at all times, the maxilla and the mandible through the dental attachments are in communication with the outside environment. And that necessitates that this uh, organ, the maxilla and the mandible, are able to undertake a, a significant amount of remodeling to deal with this constant bombardment of bacteria and, and outside environment compared to any other bone in the body. A, a really simple analogy, guys, I'm sure a lot of you are max facts. All you need to do is think and, and look at how many times we can safely sit on a fractured mandible on the ward before we take them to theater to fix them. Nothing goes wrong. They take some antibiotics, we fix their mandible, they're off home within 24 hours without a problem. Now, if you said that to an orthopedic surgeon, they would commit suicide. With an orthopedic surgeon, if they have an open fracture, they have to take their patients to theater within six hours. Otherwise, they're gonna end up with an osteomyelitis and severe complications from the fracture. So it's really important to appreciate how lucky we are in the maxillofacial region that the maxilla and the mandible are well accommodated to the oral pathogens, the commensals that live in the body. And they are able to deal with it because they have a significant amount of adaptation and turnover to deal with these pathogens. And unfortunately, predisposition to dental pathology, caries, perioendo lesions, uh, they all require appropriate bone metabolism to regain this homeostasis that we've described. So it's because the maxillofacial region is so well accommodated to this state of homeostasis that it succumbs to a problem with remodeling. So as we said, MRONG is a problem that is, it's a remodeling issue. It's a, it's a molecular problem with the healing and the remodeling. And because the maxillofacial region is so geared up to heal, it stumbles when something prevents this homeostasis. Uh, and as I said, the problem does not exist in any other bone in the body. Incidence of MRONG. 0.8 to 12% in patients treated with IV compared to 1 in 700,000 of patients treated with oral bisphosphonates. And I make no apology in actually stopping here and, 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 and stressing the massive incidence difference between the IV group that can go as high as 12% and the low incidence in patients that are on oral bisphosphonates, which is one in 700,000. It's been very, very difficult to get these figures because there's very, very few papers that actually commit to um, a, a, a set incidence, but certainly my uh, clinical practice reflects this, this incidence. I've certainly seen a lot more uh, MRONG in patients that have had IV agents or IV biologicals such as denisumab. Uh, as compared to patients that have had the oral, uh, the oral bisphosphonates. Now, MRONG is clinically staged exactly the same as we stage uh, uh, osteoradio uh, necrosis ORN. It's the American Society for Bone and Mineral uh, Research that has come up with this classification. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's a very helpful classification and it's very straightforward. You've got your stage one, two, and three. Stage one is where you have exposed uh, breakdown in the, in the mucosa with exposure of a single cortex of the bone. Stage two is where the exposure extends into the cancellous bone underneath the cortex. And stage three is where you've got extension from the epithelium, first cortex, mu uh, cancellous bone, and another cortex. So for example, in the mandible, it'll, it'll, it's disease that extends to the lower border or to the contralateral uh, cortex of the bone. So it's really interesting to see that that um, uh, succession. And um, clinically, I think the classification is really quite simple. This is just a diagrammatic reflection. You've got mucosal breakdown, you've got involvement of uh, one cortex, but the cancellous bone is intact. Uh, incidentally, this group of patients are the majority of patients that we see in the unit, thankfully. It's very rare to see patients that progress to, to stage two and stage three. Um, only soft tissue involvement, as we said, and predominantly this is treated conservatively. So very little in the way of antibiotics. I would certainly not give any antibiotics to this group of patients. I would give them uh, a, a chlorexidine uh, uh, topically. So corsido, chlorexidine, mouthwash is fine, but I would not be giving systemic uh, uh, antibiotics to this group. And what I tend to do is I tend to await, let the area heal, from the inside out, and what tends to happen is that the inf affected cortex purely just falls off uh, and you get healthy granulation tissue from underneath. And obviously, as I was saying, a very small number progressed to stage two, where you've got involvement of the cortex and the cancellous bone, a little bit more difficult to manage, and we'll go through that in a minute. And obviously, you've got your stage three, where you've got total involvement of the whole thickness of the bone, cortex, cancellous bone, and the contralateral cortex. And unfortunately, this group is the group that requires uh, resections. You can tell the difference between healthy bone and the uh, disease, disease bone. Pathological fractures are very high risk within this group of patients. From a dental practice point of view, your management is prompt referral to the maxillofacial unit or an oral medicine unit, depending on where you are. Uh, I would tend to undertake simple plain radiographs and the CT scan. Uh, and I, I, I personally, my practice is not to obtain a, CDT, a CBCT scan in the department. My practice is to request a formally reported CT scan via our radiology uh, uh, colleagues purely because we're all, we're, we all report on CBCTs and we're all trained on reporting CBCTs, but it is incredibly rarely for us to be reporting CBCTs for this condition. We all tend to report CBCTs for implant placement, sinus lifting, you know, simple, simple pathology. But when it comes to uh, detailed bone pathology, I tend to leave the reporting to our radiology uh, consultant colleagues. As I was saying, stage one, I tend to give chlorexidine and follow up the patients until either the cortical dead bone, the necrotic bone comes loose and I pick it off or uh, the area heals spontaneously. If they progress to stage two, I consider antibiotics. I don't normally give antibiotics, but I do consider antibiotics to prevent super added infections. And it's really important to stress this now. I know there's a lot of discussion about antibiotic therapy, but a really good example is COVID-19. COVID-19 is a viral infection. We do not treat viral infections with antibiotics. I'm fully aware of that. But as soon as you have someone who's intubated on an ITU unit, they get IV antibiotics to prevent a super added pneumonia. You prevent a bacterial infection in a diseased organ. And that's exactly where antibiotics uh, can come into play in stage two, especially if there's a significant inflammatory process. Analgesia is a significant part and obviously relieve dentures to make sure you've got no pressure points. They're all simple things that we all know. Unfortunately, those small group that do progress to stage three will definitely require uh, some form of antibiotic therapy and surgical deb debridement and grafting if necessary. So incredibly serious if we get to stage three. Uh, these are just some of the clinical cases that I came across as I was preparing for the lecture. You can go from simple stage one, two, all the way to fistula extraorally, and obviously exposed bone, uh, as you can see. 
I'm just going to let you look at these um, these images because they are actually incredibly serious um, conditions. Clinical practice: How do I? How how does how have the Scottish guidelines shaped my clinical practice? And I have to say, it, it, they absolutely fantastic guidelines. And you won't believe it, guys. As long as I've been doing this, I've this I've got this laminated on the wall in in the practice where I deliver IMOS and um, at the hospital. And essentially speaking, you go through a, uh, I'm sure you're all well aware of these, but I'm just going to go through it for the sake of our colleagues who, uh, who may not be practicing in the UK. Um, essentially, we go through the process. Has the patient ever had a diagnosis of MRONG? If the answer is yes, they instantly come under the higher risk category. So if they've had MRONG in the past, you bypass all of that, you go straight to a high risk category. If they haven't had MRONG, the next question, is the patient being treated with an anti-resorptive or anti-angiogenic drug? And that's obviously uh, a bisphosphonate or the denisumabs and you know, the other biologicals that we deal with. If the answer is uh, yes, then they become high risk. If the answer is no, is the patient currently taking a bisphosphonate drug or having taken one in the past? And I stress the fact that have they ever taken one in the past because by definition, it doesn't quantify the length of time except with denisumab. And we're going to come to denisumab in a minute. So if the answer is yes, they've had a bisphosphonate in the past, has it been less than five years? And if it's more than five years, then they go into a high risk category. If it's less than five years, they then ask, have they ever had a systemic steroid? And if there's a combination of a system, so it's a concurrent, so concurrent use of a systemic steroid and a bisphosphonate, instantly these patients go into high risk category. So it's not just the bisphosphonate, it's the concurrent use of a, of a, of a glucocorticoid as well. If they don't have a glucocorticoid, they come under low risk and if they've had denisumab, currently taking denisumab, or have taken denisumab in the last nine months, if the answer is yes, you then ask about the steroids. If they are taking steroids in conjunction with denisumab, then they instantly go into the high risk category. I find this very helpful, guys, and I, I tend to stick with it, and I tend to go through this diagnostic process, and I'll, I'll talk in a little while about my clinical approach to patients and how I consent them in practice. The most important thing is before you start therapy is to get the mouth in as healthy a condition as possible. And I think this is where we as the dental and the maxillofacial and the oral medicine and the restorative communities have been very, very slow to reach out to the GP community and to really stress the importance of sending a patient to their general dental practitioner prior to commencing. Uh, uh, a bisphosphonate, uh, especially if it's an IV bisphosphonate. So I think we have failed and we have failed miserably for many years, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that now the message is really starting to, uh, to come out to the general dental practitioner, to, uh, sorry, to the general practitioners so that they can refer their patients to the dentist for a thorough dental checkup before commencement of therapy. Any uh, poorly prognostic teeth or any uh, active infections in the maxillofacial region have to be dealt with before commencing uh, a bisphosphonate. Um, and obviously make sure that the patients are aware it's part of the, uh, the standard consent process to make sure patients are aware that they are at risk of MRONG if they commence on, on, on this therapy. A lot of the drugs now come with a warning card attached to it so that patients are able to present that card to their dentists if they're requiring any uh, dental procedure that requires bone remodeling. From a general dental practitioner point of view, carry out all routine dentistry as normal and continue to provide personalized preventative advice. By that, I mean, if, you've have, if you have someone who's on a two yearly OPG and follow up, you might want to bring them in sooner if they commence a bisphosphonate so that you are seeing them more regularly. Uh, we tend to advise to perform straightforward extractions and other bone impacting treatments in low risk patients. And I'm more than happy for that to be undertaken in primary care. There is no specific need for these patients to be referred into a, a, a hospital unit for that. And 
as a golden rule, and I will not be able to stress this more, adopt a more conservative approach in higher risk patients. So if someone falls down the flow chart and ends up in the higher risk group, I tend to stress the importance of absolutely preventing extractions unless absolutely necessary. And it's not just extractions, it's extractions and other bone impacting treatments as per the Scottish guidelines. Uh, I can't tell you guys, honestly, the number of times I've had referrals in, in, in my almost existence and um, I've, I've sent patients back, I've counseled them, I've had a chat and I've said, I'm really sorry guys, I want you to go back to your dentist, try and do anything you can to prevent you losing this tooth, even if it means referral to a specialist endodontist for consideration of, end, and, and of, of you know, root canal therapy, even if it's outside the competence of a general dental practitioner, then I think this group should be referred to an endodontist or a specialist restorative uh, consultant for consideration of uh, uh, a root canal therapy so that we could prevent extraction at all costs. Having said that, obviously, if a tooth needs to go, it needs to go, and we will have to accept the risk as long as the consent process is carried out in detail. And I cannot stress the importance of the consent process. In, in my IMOS existence, I see all of my IV bisphosphonate patients for a preoperative consultation where I sit, I do a thorough assessment, I go through the process and I go through the warnings and I send them away with leaflets to think about it before they come back and commit to having the tooth out. So I cannot stress, guys, how important it is uh, to go through the, uh, the consent process for this group. The last thing you want to do is someone to end up with a resection or a hemimandibular resection for a simple, a simple tooth extraction that could have been avoided. Moving forwards, I don't tend to prescribe antibiotics uh, following extractions um, to reduce the risk of hemorrhage. This is not an infection, so we do not prescribe antibiotics to prevent the risk. But again, this is a, a point where each one of us will have to take a, 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 an informed decision based on the patient and the clinical condition. I always review my patients uh, at eight weeks to make sure that they don't have any exposed bone. This is purely the patients that are on IV bisphosphonates. I do not review patients that are on oral bisphosphonates unless they bring up with a problem. Um, and if you suspect a patient has a spontaneous emronge, then the guidelines are to refer directly to the hospital um, uh, without review. So again, I'm going to leave this slide for everyone to, to have a look at later on. Again, it's a, it's a printout from the Scottish guidelines in, in a little bit more detail. And as I said, most important things to go through the consent process in details, uh, advise the patients of the risk of emronge, aim to get the patient as dentally fit as feasible, and with the low risk patients, you consent, you undertake the treatment in dental practice and a follow up uh, it, with the general dental practitioner. High risk patients, I uh, tend to avoid procedures as much as possible. If extraction is needed, then ideally I'm more than happy to see patients in, 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 on, in the IMOS service for IVs, for patients on IV bisphosphonates. But I personally undertake a review at eight weeks time. So I do expect the GDPs to undertake a review at eight weeks for their oral bisphosphonates, but I personally don't review uh, oral bisphosphonate patients. I, I, I uh, leave that to the GDP, and if there's a problem, they obviously get back to me. So I'm gonna take a breath and, and, and pause for a minute. I think we'll take questions at the end, but I wanted to discuss ORN, osteoradionecrosis at this point. Pure, not, I'm not going to go into that much detail, but I really just want to pinpoint the major differences between MRONG and ORN because the disease processes are similar, but the pathogenesis and the molecular principles behind it are very, very different. So by definition, osteoradionecrosis uh, is a necrosis following uh, radiotherapy to the maxillofacial region. Uh, it is not a primary infection of bone, rather a complex metabolic problem and uh, tissue homeostatic deficiency, as we discussed. Microbial studies did not demonstrate any microorganisms uh, within the bone specimens that were discussed. They were only present on the surface. So again, no role for antibiotics in the management of our ORN in general, but every case is different. If someone presents with an active infection, of course, they're gonna require antibiotics, but to prevent or to deal with a super added infection, 
but not to manage the underlying pathogenesis, which is ORM. Clinically, patients present having had radiotherapy with a foul odor, exposed bones, severe pain, fistulation, and sometimes mucosal and cutaneous defects. Now, it's very interesting to, to realize that osteoradionecrosis, again, can present spontaneously, though is incredibly rare. It has to have followed a procedure or a process where the bone has been expected to remodel. Um, as we were saying, blood supply is absolutely crucial in, the, in understanding blood supply is absolutely crucial in understanding the pathogenesis of irradiated bone. So as we were saying, the ID nerve is obliterated with age. Uh, the group, the cohort of patients that receive radiotherapy to the maxillofacial region are usually within the age group that have had a, a disease process affecting the inferior alveolar nerve. Uh, and the disease process is a soft tissue vessel and arthritis. So most of our endothelial cells are labile. They are stable cells. They are not required to divide when you take a tooth out. As part of the granulation tissue development, as part of, of the healing process by secondary intention, you require angiogenesis. And this is where the problem happens. With, uh, with, the, with angiogenesis, the, 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 the DNA within the cell is required to divide. Because the radiotherapy has damaged the DNA within the cell, the cell is unable to divide and you get a problem with cellular growth at the uh, capillary level and hence the endarthritis that we've just discussed. So it's a very, very different disease process as compared to uh, uh, MRONG, which is uh, uh, cellular signaling predominantly and bis uh, bisphosphonate deposition within the bone. I'm gonna, I brought this in specifically for Mr. Ramid because I know this is a, a difficult point and, and we're all, we're all expected to review our patients before commencing radiotherapy to assess which teeth need to be extracted. These patients have to undergo a, a, um, a thorough dental assessment. And I think there's a lot of discrepancy. I, I, I can promise you, you can speak to as many specialists as you want. There is no consensus when it comes to which teeth are to be extracted pre-radiotherapy. What I will give you now is my personal experience, what I tend to do, what my opinion, and there's a lot of things that shape my opinion. It's the years of exposure that I've seen to patients that have had uh, ORN. I've seen patients that are 10, 15 years post cancer. They got over the cancer, they beat the cancer, they're fit, they're healthy. They have a tooth out and they end up with a fibula flap to reconstruct a hemimandibulectomy. And when you remember cases like this, I tend to be more aggressive in my stance uh, in managing patients that require preoperative uh, dental, pre-radiotherapy dental extractions. I am a firm believer of the shortened dental arch. I am not saying anything behind the five is to be extracted. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying any tooth with a dubious diagnosis or you know, close to pulp uh, 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 rest restorations, I feel a lot more comfortable with those teeth being removed rather than being left to chance. Um, third molars that are partially erupted, I tend to remove. Third molars that are fully bony impacted, I tend to leave behind, just because of the increased risk uh, associated with the procedure. So again, I, 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 I'm gonna allow Mr. Ramid at the end to come in and, and give us his opinion. I know he, he, this is his area of expertise and not mine, but I'm one who is a little bit more aggressive when it comes to pre radiotherapy extractions purely because I have seen the other side. I have seen the problems that arise when, when patients haven't had uh, uh, proper pre radiotherapy assessments and uh, ultimately end up with osteoradionecrosis. The basic principles that we tend to follow, again, this is all stuff that we all know, treatment begins with prevention, communication with the oncologist, communication with the restorative team, absolutely crucial. And nowadays, the restorative consultant is part of the head and neck MDT. So Mr. Ramid uh, sits on the head and neck MDT every week, and it is his there's a, a, a significant stress on the importance of having a restorative consultant as part of the head and neck uh, cancer team. Uh, 
prophylaxis, as we were discussing, fluoride therapy going forwards, these are all things that you guys know, smoking cessation, and if extractions are necessary, obviously have them pre-radiotherapy, and obviously atraumatic technique and primary closure. So if I'm seeing someone that needs six, seven, you know, six, seven, eight removed, I tend to take the teeth out, reduce the alveolar height, and advance the mucosa to obtain primary closure. The main reason behind that, guys, is that it promotes the healing prior to radiotherapy. What you want is the lack of delay between the patient having the teeth uh, removed and uh, then going on to have the radiotherapy. So you don't want a delay uh, for any reason. Hopefully a little bit more interesting now. Um, I'm going to go through some of my clinical cases that I've been involved with um, and just go through them to, to show you the different disease processes and how they impact on the maxillofacial region. I think we've only got another uh, five, ten minutes to go, so I'll be brief. This is a lovely lady that I've looked at for about six, seven years now in, in Portsmouth. She has multiple myeloma and she is on an IV bisphosphonate. As you can tell, she's maintained her dentition throughout her life. Uh, but in her 80s, she's developed problems around that tooth and a problem around that tooth. You can see the sub, um, uh, the caries underneath the, um, the restorations. So she had those two teeth out. And it's really interesting to look at this radiograph because you can see how beautifully the maxilla is healing and how poor the healing within the mandible, uh, unfortunately, has, uh, has gone. And this is six months down the line, guys. You can see the extension of the emronge down the mandible, involvement of the ID canal. This patient at this time presented with a numb lip. Um, and it's very sad, but again, this patient was so medically compromised, wheelchair bound, you can imagine someone in their 80s on a bisphosphonate, and this is not the type of patient that you're going to be undertaking a resection on and putting a fibula free flap. And it, it goes back to the importance of trying to prevent the extraction in the first place. I cannot stress the importance uh, of preventing extractions unless they're needed in patients on IV agents. Again, you look at the upper left seven region, the healing is beautiful, absolutely no clinical problems, but unfortunately, she then developed a large carious lesion on several of the other teeth. She ended up with further extractions, as you can tell. Again, the maxilla healed beautifully and the mandible, we are just nursing, even though the disease is extending, you can see around the five, we're literally just nursing this patient along uh, until, until hopefully she has a very comfortable remainder of her life. So I can't over, overstress the importance of, of, uh, of decision-making in, in managing this group of patients. A very different disease process, osteomyelitis. This is a patient that was referred to me with a very uh, arthritic joint, and she had absolute trismus when I saw this lady. Um, I ended up extracting those two teeth um, and what was initially thought to be a rheumatoid joint causing trismus was actually trismus caused by dental sepsis. Uh, no disrespect to our rheumatology colleagues, they're not trained at looking at this process. And again, I've nursed this lady for many, many years now looking after her. And after she had her teeth out, uh, this was a CT scan of her mandible and you can tell um, a very, very different disease process compared to MRONG and ORN. This is a very uh, horrible infective process, osteomyelitis. You can see it extends almost to the midline. That's your lovely healthy bone uh, on the left-hand side, and this is the diseased bone. And it went all the way up into the uh, condylar head on the affected side. This lady ended up having long-term clindamycin therapy, and I sought an opinion from uh, my bone colleagues in Oxford. I'm, I'm really lucky in Southampton. We've got a fantastic link with the hub at Oxford under the care of Mr. Nad Saeed, and he again has a fantastic bone uh, pathophysiology team that he deals with that uh, look after our patients for us. Again, a very different disease process. This is ORN affecting the frontal bone. This is, a, again, 
bless him, he passed away now, this gentleman. He had uh, an SCC of his, of his eyelids. He ended up with an orbital exenteration. And I managed to put some implants in the periorbital region to give him a, a, a magnetic uh, retained prosthesis. And I remember four or five years down the line, he developed a recurrence. He had to have radiotherapy for which he, he had his radiotherapy without any problems. And then he presented one day to clinic with one of his implants in his hand. He said, hello, hello, Mo, look, I've got an implant. It just dropped out. So I examined him. I will never forget that day. And I looked through his empty uh, uh, eye socket and I could see the undersurface of his brain through the frontal bone here, through, through the roof of the orbit. Now, thank God, I decided not to uh, undertake a biopsy. And I said, let's just go straight to a CT scan because looking at it clinically, there was no way to tell whether this was recurrent disease or whether it was uh, any other bone problem. And thankfully, we undertook a CT scan which confirmed uh, ORN of the frontal bone. So again, as opposed to MRONG, ORN can occur in any bone that's exposed to the surface, having had radiotherapy. Um, and unfortunately, this gentleman succumbed to a brain abscess under the care of our uh, neurosurgical colleagues in Southampton. So again, a very, very different, but very interesting disease process. Finally, fibrous dysplasia. Again, this is a patient that presented to me with trigeminal neuralgia of the uh, mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve on the right-hand side. So as you can see, foramen ovale has been totally replaced by this aggressive fibrous dysplasia that affected his skull base. And his only presentation was trigeminal neuralgia-like symptoms affecting the uh, mandibular division VC on the right hand side and again I remember you looked at him he was a he was a young chap he wasn't the right age for uh, trigeminal neuralgia and with this group of patients I purely go straight to scan to rule out other pathological processes especially even in younger patients you need to rule out MS as a potential cause of of facial pain and I, I, I remember the scans came back and your jaw just dropped at the degree of fibrous dysplasia present here. And again, this chap was referred to the skull base team in Southampton, and he eventually was managed on IV bisphosphonates. So it's really interesting just to see those last few slides and to, uh, to see the different disease processes that can affect the bones of the maxillofacial region. And I think that's it. Mr. Ramid, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Algomi. Uh, Again, very interesting talk. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly tonight. Mr. Ogomi, thank you very much for putting the talk together, the interesting cases together. I think what is interesting about this topic is the discussion and the controversy about the topics you discussed. Yes. Actually, I could have uh, probably had more of your, um, the slides you put, the discussions, because quite interesting, there is no black and white like anything in medicine. A lot of gray areas and um, to be perfectly honest with you, um, uh, we need more. I think as GDPs, as dentists, uh, healthcare professionals in general, even general practitioners, we need to know more about the etiology, about physiology, about the um, mechanism of developing such lesions. Because we see only the horrible cases and we always wonder, why did that happen? And that could be could have been sorted easily and simply at the primary care level. Anyway, I cannot uh, agree more, Mr. Ramid, in that a lot of the, the, the problems arise in the decision-taking process. I say this to all of my, my younger colleagues in training at the hospital. Surgery is easy. There is nothing difficult about undertaking the surgical procedure. The, the difficulty with surgery is the decision-taking process. Taking the correct decision no, for the patient is the most important thing. And as, um, as you know, you and I have been working together for years now, and, and you know, we, we, it's very easy for us to have disagreements about management plans, and, and we sit and we talk about these things, but it's a reflection of the lack of evidence that is present, the lack of, I mean, honestly, it's really difficult to put a, a talk like this together because of the lack of peer review, black and white evidence to support any statement that you make. And a lot of what we do in practice is based on opinion, it's based on best, best evidence at the point of taking the decision. 
but also I cannot stress the importance of the MDT approach. And that's how I was saying, you are a, 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 an integral member of the head and neck team. The head and neck team, it's surgeons, it's uh, restorative consultants, it's oncology, it's radiotherapy, it's head and neck. There are so many different team members that come into play. And as long as these patients are managed in an MDT fashion, lots of sharing of information, lots of opinion, then we know we will deliver the best possible outcome to the patient. So I cannot agree more with what you've said. Indeed, Mr. Alboni. And also uh, here, we have got a chance as well to remind our colleagues, dentists and doctors that they can pick up the phone and talk to you, talk Absolutely. to your local unit about what's the best way, because sometimes it's confusing, especially with the complex and the new medications coming all the time. I Google the medications to see how do they work. And sometimes you think, oh, this is like one of the families could have impact on the bone regeneration or the bone healing, but sometimes it's not necessary. So I think we need to keep up to date and ask people like yourself. I'm very comfortable, Mr. Ramid, when a patient comes in and they're on a medication that I'm not familiar with. I'm very comfortable saying, do you know what? I haven't come across this before. I'm going to take some time to do a literature search and I'll get back to you and let you know. I'm, I have no problems in, in, in doing that. It's part of my normal routine practice. And I think patients actually trust you more Indeed. when you stand up and you say, do you know what? I've never come across this before, but I'm going to do a literature search and I'm going to ask you to come back and see me next week and we'll put our heads together and come up with a plan. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Algoni. I've got a few questions from the audience. If you don't, Please. I think quite important to brief questions. Uh, one of the questions saying, should I review the patient after extraction every week for eight weeks? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think best practice is to make sure you see them at eight weeks, but also to make sure that there's an open door policy. So I say to my patients, you've got my number, you can contact me at any time. I want to see you at eight weeks as long as you have no problems. That's but if the patient- Review patient after eight weeks of the extraction. Yes, so with IV bisphosphonates, I bring all of them back at eight weeks to review, but they know they can contact me at any time. I personally don't review patients on oral bisphosphonates, but I expect the general dental practitioner to be involved with that. I don't think a weekly review is necessary. I think open door policy, come back and see me at any time. And I have to say, Mr. Ramid, all of our practices will be changing because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, episode that we're all living now. So I think be sensible, ask for patients to come back if they have any problems, uh, but I tend to review all of my IV bisphosphonate patients at eight weeks. Excellent. I wanted to come back to the uh, COVID crisis uh, after finishing the question because I think we're going to change our practice somehow for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. I have a question from the same person saying, what about vasectomies? What are your thoughts of a vasectomy in bisphosphonate patients? Exactly the same. It is a procedure that will induce a bone remodeling process. And I would do, I follow exact, it's any procedure that involves bone remodeling carries exactly the same risk. And that's why the Scottish guidelines uh, equally state that it's not just extractions, it's any bone uh, healing or bone impeding procedure. Now, there has to be a degree of common sense. If you've got, let me give you an example. If you've got a four unit bridge with an abutment on the three, yeah. and the three requires an apisectomy. If you lose the three, you're gonna lose your four unit bridge. I tend to weigh, the, weigh each case. I'm giving this as an example of how guidelines are not rules. Guidelines are there to, to guide us, to help us reach a sensible decision. If someone's on an oral bisphosphonate, I would go ahead and do an apisectomy. I wouldn't mind doing an apisectomy. But I wouldn't go straight to apisectomy if a re-root canal is an option. And that's why the importance of this MDT, the importance of a restorative consultant who can look at a patient and say, yes, you should have a redo of your root canal to try and sort the problem out, or I'm really sorry, you've got a post in core. If I remove the post crown, I'm gonna end up breaking the root, then let's go straight to apisectomy. But I'm using it as an example to say, every case is judged independently. If I come across someone who's fit, who's healthy, who's on an oral bisphosphonate that requires a, a, an apisectomy of a three, that's, a, that's an abutment for a bridge, a multi-unit bridge, I would go ahead and do it. But if someone comes to me on an IV bisphosphonate, of course I wouldn't do it. 
I would avoid all surgical extractions at any cost. That's what you can say, Ron. It's, um, it's using our best judgment, is the, I think, is the answer. And I think we will be judged by our peers, Mr. Ramid. Uh, when things go wrong, thankfully rarely, but when they go wrong, it is our peers that judge us. It is people like us that are in the same situation as us. And as long as all decisions, number one, are taken in good faith, number two, are taken on best clinical evidence, and number three, most importantly, are documented in the notes and as part of the consent process then really that's all that is required from a, from a medical legal perspective. Right, and so there's another question one of our colleagues asking, what are your thoughts about placing dental implants in bisphosphonate patients? Again, it's based on an individual assessment. I have no problems in placing dental implants in someone who's on an oral bisphosphonate because of the reduced risk of a problem, but I would not touch a patient who uh, is on an IV bisphosphonate or a biological such as denisumab, etc. And I actually feel quite strongly about this. I'm sure there are other ways that this group of patients can be helped, but I, but I, I just feel the risk of, of any bone, uh, uh, bone inducing or bone remodeling process is, is very high. Right, and same colleague asking about, what do you think about the research talking about dipping dental implants in bisphosphonates before placing them? Uh, some of the uh, I, it's not something that I practice and, and it's not something that I've come across so I wouldn't be able to help you with that I'm, I'm sorry unless you know something different Mr. Ramit. I don't know to be honest with you um, uh, since when I was um, at King's Unit training we have got a unit using this disconate for research purposes to see if there is any potential of better regeneration and healing uh, but I haven't come across somebody using it clinically. I can understand the principle of stabilizing the bone in the peri-implant tissue or the, the bone at the union between the implant and, and the jaw, but it, it's certainly not my practice and certainly not something that I have practiced clinically or have come across clinically. Indeed. Um, another question from the same colleague again saying, what about placing implants in RN patients? Is there any specific duration for how long the effects of MRONG and ORN are expected. Okay, unfortunately with ORN, the, the effects are lifelong. So the disease process, as I was saying, the radiation damages the DNA. What the DNA is absolutely fine until the cell is expected to divide. And once it starts to divide, then ORN kicks in. So ORN is lifelong. You will never ever shake the risk of ORN. And as I'm sure Mr. Ramid is a lot more aware of this than I am because it's his area of expertise, uh, the risk of, of implant failure in ORN, but in um, radiated bone is, is one in five. It's 20% as opposed to 2% or 2.5% in, in normal patients. So again, I wouldn't mind putting an implant in someone who's had uh, 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 radiotherapy. I would explain to them the risks involved. I would, ex I would document on the consent form a risk of failure of uh, the implant at 20 percent and a risk of induction of osteonecrosis. Right. The, only dif uh, the only difference is with placing an implant in ORN bone, you are not leaving a bony cavity. Therefore, there isn't that much angiogenesis that is required as opposed to taking the tooth out and leaving the tooth socket to heal by secondary intention. When it comes to patients on IV bisphosphonates, I, I would not consider implant therapy in this group of patients at, at any cost. Thank you very much. I hope that answers the question. That's definitely, very clear. Uh, another interesting question. Um, it's gonna fire a lot of questions, Mr. Gomi. I do apologize. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. No, it's fine. Is there any relation between bisphosphonate and vitamin D? And vitamin? D. Um, Yes. Well there, yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of research on pentoxifilin, and it's. It, I have to say, a lot of the research that has come out has has got very very little evidence to back it up. There are very very few double blind trials that recommend uh, uh, pentoxifilin to patients. Now, I have to say, in my clinical practice, there are a few occasions where I do trial uh, pentoxifilin, and it's usually in patients where I've literally run out of options, especially if you've got someone who's 
elderly who's got a very poor performance status who will not do well with an operation and they've got quite significant active disease I tend to say, well, there's no harm, even though the evidence is very poor when it comes to pentoxifying and vitamin E, etc. Yeah. I, I tend to give it because I have no other option available to me. But yeah. I cannot say that pentoxifying is a mainstream part of my clinical practice purely because uh, there is very little evidence to support it works. And the evidence that is present is not level you know, one, two, and three evidence, it, it, it's less than that. And I'd be interested to hear how, how you feel, Mr. Ramid, because I know this is something you, you, you've worked with before. I completely agree. I agree with you, Mr. Aldoni. I do prescribe uh, pentexophylin, and uh, for most cases, which we run out of options, and I give it QDS for three months. And uh, sometimes I refer it to you for something, uh, if we can. Yeah. And I think we can, sometimes we get good results with the surgical option, which I will come to this point later if you don't mind. I've got a question from one of our oral surgeon colleagues asking, what's your opinion and thoughts on primary closure following extractions in bisphosphonate patients? If I'm perfectly honest with you, for IV bisphosphonate patients, that's my practice anyway. That's what I do. I do not do that for patients on oral bisphosphonates. I do it for patients on IV bisphosphonates. I do tend to, especially, uh, uh, and, and the ORN patients, so patients that are, that are GTAB radiotherapy, I like to primarily close the tooth sockets just to promote as much healing prior to commencing radiotherapy. As I'm sure you're all well aware, we, we aim to commence radiotherapy uh, three, maybe six weeks post extractions if we can, the shorter the time, the better. And I, I, tend to, I tend to close the sockets for that effect. So it is part of my practice when I'm dealing with pre radiotherapy extractions, and it is part of my, pro, in my, my practice for patients receiving IV bisphosphonates, but I do not do it for uh, my patients that have oral bisphosphonates. You have to balance, though, to undertake the procedure, you do have to reduce the height of the alveolar process before you advance the... Um, uh, the bone and to fix it and that in itself can induce trauma so as much as you want to undertake an atraumatic procedure you in doing so will induce a, a degree of trauma to the tissues Indeed. so it's always a balance but as I say I, I am fairly happy to do it for IV bisphosphonate patients and for uh, pre-radiotherapy extractions. Thank you very much. A lot of um, thanks coming from the audience for this interesting and fantastic presentation. But okay. before, well, there's another question here, Mr. Algon, if you may. Mm -hmm. Is there any specific time for dental extractions prior to bisphosphonate or radiotherapy? Uh, yes, a lot, of, a lot of research has looked at radiotherapy. Not, not a lot of research has looked at bisphosphonates. With it comes to radiotherapy, we tend to recommend a, a minimum of three, month, three weeks of healing prior to commencing radiotherapy. And that's been well published in randomized controlled trials. So I'm very comfortable with that. When it comes to uh, for bisphosphonates, I think it's a reasonable decision. If someone hasn't commenced a bisphosphonate, if you see them at three to four weeks and the tissues are healing, I tend to authorize them to go ahead and have their uh, bisphosphonate therapy with, with, the, um, with the dentist. If it's an IV bisphosphonate, I have to see them to ensure that they've healed prior to commencing uh, IV bisphosphonate therapy. And I think a reasonable three to six weeks is, is, is a reasonable option. Now, taking, taking, having said that, you also take into account what are in the indications for these people having, for these patients having treatment. If someone is having an IV bisphosphonate because of the risk of cord compression, i.e. they may not walk for the rest of their lives, I want them to start straight away. If someone is taking it because they've got a pathological fracture of their femur and they have to be treated on in theater, then they have to start it straight away. So what I'm trying to say is that guidelines are there, time frames are there, but really your clinical judgment at the end is what will, is what will, will save the day, as they say. Indeed. Does that make sense? Yes, makes a lot of sense. Um, sorry, there's other question coming through uh, from the audience, if you don't mind. Um, Please, no, go ahead. Uh, the question is, do you recommend vitamin D and calcium supplements in such group of patients? Yes, I think calcium is, is absolutely fine. I have no problems with patients being on calcium, and most of them do have it. But you also have to take into account the general condition of the patient. Calcium is, is a drug not without side effects for a large number of people. 
And therefore, I think it's really important to balance the benefit. I certainly would have no issues in someone having calcium, but there's a lot of research now that says if someone's been on a bisphosphonate for a set number of years, usually five, or if someone's had calcium supplementation for the same period of time, then they, they are not necessary anymore. So I think I would leave that to the medical practitioners to, to, to manage as opposed to us to prescribe. But I think there is mileage in calcium to, uh, to, to augment bone. Great. Uh, I tend to um, close the session, but actually there's a question, there's a nagging question in my head, Mr. Algomi, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you a personal question. What's your uh, personal preference in terms of the antibacterial uh, or antimicrobial therapy for such group of patients, if you decide to give anything as a junctive or post of therapy? I think that the, the answer is going to have to be based on local microbiology guidelines, Mr. Ramid. For all hospital practitioners, we all have a very active microbiology department with microbiology guidelines that we have to adhere to. In my personal opinion, the uh, acute setting is very different from the long-term setting. So if I'm giving someone antimicrobials for an acute problem, erythema, sepsis, pus, then the guidelines are very clear. It's amoxicillin and metronidazole or a penicillin of sorts and metronidazole as we practice in the hospital. If I've got someone where I want to give them a prolonged course of bone penetrating antibiotic, then my antibiotic of choice is clindamycin. Uh, I know it's an old fashioned antibiotic, but I'm very comfortable prescribing it to patients. Um, as long as these patients are fully aware of the potential side effects, the potential colitis problems, that can arise from uh, clindamycin therapy. But I'm, I'm a very big fan of clindamycin. It works beautifully. It's an old fashioned antibiotic with a fantastic bone penetrance. Uh, and I, I tend to find very, very good results. Certainly my patient who had osteomyelitis of her mandible that I referred to Oxford, she ended up on a 12 month course of clindamycin as prescribed by the bone physiology department at, uh, at Oxford University. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Algomi. I think there are many, many questions, but I think, I, sorry, I have to finish the session um, and to end it here. The, just to remind the audience, please, if you download your CP certificate, it's in the chat box, in the chat message, in the chat box coming as a picture. You can add your name and your GDC or GMC number. I put GDC and I think probably only Mr. Algomi has got GMC number. We are not privileged to have double qualifications, but you can add GDC number to have your CPD uh, hour. Uh, actually, it's more than hour uh, for today, but uh, we can claim only one hour because this is the schedule of the webinar. And uh, just to remind you guys, uh, we have that session on Monday at 7 p.m. again with one of our local dental technologists uh, talking about the reconstruction for dental implants, Paul Dimpleton. If you can join us, please, on Monday at 7 p.m., that would be great. And on your behalf, I'd like to thank Mr. Algomi for his valuable time. Pleasure, absolutely. Again, I'd like to invite him again for more sessions. People ask for the recordings. With your permission, would you be able to uh, make this recording uh, available for all the audience? Uh, other absolutely, no problems. Thank you very much. It's a thank pleasure to, to, to be here, Mr. Ramida. Thank you for the kind words and the kind invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And look forward to seeing you sometime.